as he calleth thee. And he, casting away his garments, rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, What wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I may receive my sight. But there are many people today that are just like that. I read the other day that there are 42 million people in the world who are blind. Health authorities estimate that from all causes, half a million children become irreversibly blind around the world each year. And this is a great tragedy, and many people and countries and health agencies are working to turn it around. A tragedy of equal or greater proportion, though, is the spiritual blindness that people have. Because the Bible says you have two sets of eyes. You have physical eyes in which you can see, and you have spiritual eyes. And you can see physically, but you may not be able to see spiritually. And spiritual blindness affects everyone in this audience. There are thousands of people here tonight that you can see me up here, but you are spiritually blind. And it's a blindness that keeps you from really knowing God. Now, Bartimaeus was a blind man. And he came out of uh, the little place where he had spent the night. And he never had any hope that he'd ever be able to see. And he would go outside the gate of Jericho and he would beg from the people that passed by. People on the way to market or people coming to their business that day. And he would say, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind, help the blind. He had his cane. He had an old shaggy coat. He had begged some bread from a woman as he had gone on his way and he got some milk. And there he sat with other blind people and other beggars. And they were begging, hoping that the people would throw them a little bit of money or give them something. And so I look at Bartimaeus and I see myself or I see you. The Bible says he is blind spiritually. And our world leaders are groping. I listen to some of these things on television from some of our world leaders and I'm amazed at the spiritual blindness. And I have talked to some of them privately and, and I, I just, I, I want to reach over and grab them and shake them and tell them that they need Christ because Christ could go open their eyes. And I think only the, the true believers really know what's wrong with the world because what's wrong with the world is a spiritual problem. Now this Bartimaeus could not see his rags, he couldn't see his filth, he couldn't see even beauty. And from time to time we read of someone living in a house or apartment that's filled with empty containers and refuse and garbage. And the person living there may appear to lead a perfectly normal life. And they're well dressed. I know a home like that right now where the lady is well dressed. Uh, the husband is, is a doctor and they are respectable. They're fine people. And when you see them out, you, you think they're the most wonderful couple in the world. But if you ever get into their house, it is a mess. It looks like a hog pen. And that's the way it is with so many of us. We appear all right on the outside, but down in our hearts and in our souls, we know that something is wrong. And for some reason, the person doesn't seem to even care. The scripture says, but the natural man, that's the ordinary man, the man before he comes to Christ, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And it seems foolish for me to stand here and tell you that because Jesus Christ died on a cross, 2,000 years ago and rose from the dead, that that can have an impact on your life today and now and give you assurance and peace and joy that you never knew before and help settle many of the problems and relationships that you face and give you a burden for your fellow man. But it's true. And some people would call that foolish. The Bible says that the pro proclamation of the gospel is foolishness to them that perish. You see, you're blinded by the God of this world. Now, who is the God of this world? Jesus called him the devil, the prince and power of the air, the prince of this world. There's another force in the world. And that other force has supernatural power too, and that other force is the devil. And there is a conflict going on, the conflict of the ages, between the forces of God and the forces of the devil. 
You say, why does God allow that? That is a great mystery. It's a mystery as to where the devil came from. Now, the Bible tells us in the 28th chapter of Ezekiel. It also tells us in the 14th chapter of, of Isaiah. We get a little picture of it, and we get other pictures and glimpses throughout Scripture. But there is a devil. Now, he's, he doesn't rule in hell. He's never been to hell. He's alive. He's settled on this planet. Now, you can call evil anything you want to, but we all know that there's evil in the world. And we all know that something is wrong, but we don't know what. Now, the Bible tells us that back of it all is the devil. You say, but why doesn't God kill the devil and get it all over with? Well, someday God is going to do just that. He's not going to kill him. He's going to throw him into the lake of fire. But that day hasn't come yet. But the devil has already suffered a great defeat. And there's been a great victory by God at the cross. The cross looked like a defeat for God, but it was actually a defeat for the devil. And you and I can enter into the victory that Christ won at the cross when we come to know him. But till then, the God of this world has blinded our eyes, so our eyes are supernaturally blinded. And that's why only the Holy Spirit can lift those blindfolds that are on your eyes just now. He was not only blind, this man, but he was poor. And we read about the poverty in the world today, and it breaks our hearts. Many of us are suffering tonight from spiritual poverty. And then this man was not only blind and poor, but he was helpless. Bartimaeus expected to die in his blindness. No one could heal that kind of blindness. But there was a ray of hope to Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus had heard many rumors of this stranger from Galilee that was going up and down the country healing people and helping people and preaching to people. And he heard the approach of a great crowd of people. His ears were very keen and he could hear them. He heard the children. He heard the people talking among themselves. And he said, what's going on? What's going on? Nobody would tell him. And the crowd was getting closer and closer. And he grabbed the skirt of a fellow that was passing by. And he said, tell me, who is this passing through town? And this stranger that no one knows his name turned and said, Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And Bartimaeus thought to himself, Jesus of Nazareth. I've heard about him. I've heard that he can heal people, that he can help people. Maybe he could help me. You know, there only comes a few times in our lives when Jesus of Nazareth passes by and we have an opportunity like we have tonight to receive him. You see, people have been praying and the Holy Spirit has been working and many people have already received Christ. And what an hour and what a moment for you to come. This stranger gave him the message, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. I remember the story of the Surgeon General of Portugal a former surgeon general, and he was walking down the street one day and a piece of paper stuck to his foot. He went home, he pulled it off of his shoe and looked at it, and it was a gospel tract, and he decided to read it, and he read it. And to make a long story short, he was converted to Christ and became a great Christian leader and a great Bible teacher. Just a simple little witness like that. God can use all of those things, and that's why we ought to always be faithful in our witness because you never know when that waitress in the restaurant or that person that you meet at your work, they'll watch your life, of course, to see if you're backing it up by the way you live. Jesus has been passing by in Hamilton. Jesus has been passing by in the Golden Horseshoe. He may be passing by in your home. He may be passing by in the room that you occupy at a hotel. He's passing by here in Southern Ontario. And in desperation, Bartimaeus cried at the top of his voice, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. And the other beggars said, close your mouth, close your mouth. The magistrates will hear about this and they'll come and put us in prison. But he kept on crying out. This was his one moment. This was his one chance. Jesus was there and he was going to take advantage of it. And the others said, keep still, Bartimaeus. Who wants to hear anything from a poor old beggar like you? But the more they rebuked him, the more he cried out. And I want you to notice several things about it. First, he cried for the right thing. He cried for mercy. He needed other things. But the thing that he needed most of all was Christ. He needed God. Have mercy upon me, you son of David. 
have mercy upon me. That's what we all need tonight is God's mercy. Mercy. When I stand at the judgment seat of Christ, I'm not going to say, Lord, uh, I want justice. If I get justice, I'm going to end up in hell. I want mercy. And God has offered his mercy from the cross. And he says, I will forgive you and cleanse you from every sin that you've ever committed. You'll never have to face the judgment. You will never be in danger of hell if you surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And so you have to say, first of all, I am a sinner. You have to say that to yourself and maybe to others. Just like an alcoholic. Before you can help an alcoholic, you, they have to be willing to say, I'm an alcoholic. Before you can help in drug addiction, you have to say, I am a drug addict. I need help. And when you come to Christ, you must say, I am a sinner. I need help. And oh, Lord God, please help me. And then the second thing, not only did he cry for the right thing, but he cried to the right person. He cried to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the only one in all the world that could help him, stood right there. And all of his hopes were centered in him. The Bible says none other name is given among men whereby we must be saved except through the name of Jesus. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Jesus had said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And this man, Bartimaeus, was coming in the right way. He was coming to the right person. He was coming to Jesus, the Son of God. And he cried at the right time. Jesus was passing by. Suppose he had waited and said, I'm going to see what the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders have to say about him. I'll wait till he comes to Jericho again. Jesus never came to Jericho again. He may never come in this way again like this. When will we ever see a sight like this in Hamilton again? It's been a long time since this many people came and heard the gospel and so many people worked and prayed and believed as they've done here. And the churches united and cooperated as they've done. And God has been speaking and many people have been finding Christ and tonight you can find Christ. No, he called. At that moment, the Bible says, He that hardened his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. In other words, when you hear the gospel and do nothing about it, it hardens your heart a little bit more. The God, the Holy Spirit, will continue to speak to you, but you can't hear him because you get deaf. The Bible says, He from his joined to his idols, let him alone. There comes a point. I don't know where it is or when it is, but there's a point beyond which you can go. That your heart is so hard that even though God will still speak, you cannot hear. So come now while you have a, an opportunity. The great governor Felix was trembled when Paul was speaking to him about the gospel. And he said, go your way, Paul. When I have a more convenient season, I'll call for you. But he never had a more convenient season. That was his moment. That was his hour before God, and he didn't take advantage of it. The Bible says, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. There may never be a tomorrow for you. This may be the moment for you. He that hardened his heck neck, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off. Notice how Jesus met his need. Here was a great crowd of people, and we have a a way today that we think in terms of great crowds. There's a great crowd here tonight, 18,000 people, I'm told. And we think in terms of crowds. We think in terms of filling out churches and filling an auditorium or having a big crowd at a ball game. We think in terms of crowds. But it's interesting, not only did Jesus preach to the crowds, but the greatest sermons I think he ever preached were to individuals. He stopped and stood still when this blind man called him. A great crowd of leaders were around him. He could have said, I don't have time. I'm on my way to Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world. But he stopped on his way to the cross to hear this beggar's cry. He stopped dying on the cross in order to hear that thief say, Remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. He stopped when a woman touched his garment. And Jesus will stop for you tonight. Because you see, he sees you tonight as though you're the only person in all the world. He doesn't see you as a part of this great crowd. 
He sees you as you are. He knows all of your thoughts and all of your intents and all the struggles that's going on inside of you. And the Bible says he loves you and he died for you. And if you had been the only one in the whole world, he would have died for you. And Jesus not only stopped, but he said, call him. The scripture says in Luke 19, 10, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. You're lost psychologically, spiritually. You're lost. You need somebody to find you and put their arms around you. That's what he'll do for you tonight. And there was a surprise on the face of the people in the crowd to call that poor old blind beggar filthy and dirty. The first time anyone, I suppose, had ever called him. Someone threw his cloak about him. Someone gave him his cane. He threw them both away and came running and fell down before Jesus. And Jesus asked him a strange question. He'd been blind all these years, and Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine that? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord. And that word Lord means that at that moment he had received Christ into his heart. My very own Lord, that I might receive my sight. And I think he was talking not only about his physical eyes, but his spiritual eyes as well. Scientists believe that 33 million of the 42 million blind people in the world either can be cured or their blindness could have been prevented. Spiritual blindness cannot be prevented. It's caused by sin and we all have it. But it can be cured by the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll open your eyes and he can open your eyes tonight. What is your need? What do you want Christ to do for you tonight? What do you want me to do, he said. Some of you say, I want him to forgive my sin. I want him to give me assurance and so that I can know that if I died at this moment, I'd go to heaven. I want peace. I'd like to rededicate my life. I've been baptized or I've been confirmed, but somehow I don't have that personal relationship with Christ and I don't have that walk with him that I ought to have and I'd like to have that. And so I'd like to reconfirm my confirmation vows, whatever it is. And Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you whole. Not money, not good works, but your faith has made you whole. Last December, an 18-year-old student pilot named Kim was making a solo flight cross-country when she became lost in a storm. She couldn't see anything out the windshield of her small plane. She didn't know where she was or how to get out of the storm and back to the safety. Something had gone wrong with one of her instruments. So she reached for her radio and made contact with a local air traffic controller, and she said, I don't know where I am. I need some help, please, please help me. The controller located her on his radar screen and began talking her down toward a nearby airport where the weather was good. She couldn't see a thing, but he could see her on the radar. He knew where she was, which direction she was headed, where she needed to go and the best way to get there. She trusted her life to a man she had never seen whose name she did not know, and he got her out of the storm and safely to ground. Tonight, you can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've never seen him with your naked eye. You may not know him, but he's there waiting for you with open arms to help you. So I'm asking you to quit flying blind. Trust yourself to Jesus Christ. Follow the guidance of his instruments, which is the word of God, the Bible. And then the scripture says, and immediately, immediately he received his sight. For some people, it's that quick. For other people, it's a period of time in which you're convicted of the Spirit of God and you grow gradually into the knowledge. But there comes a moment when you make that step from death to life, from darkness to light. I'm asking you to take that step tonight. And if you have any doubts about it in your heart, make your commitment tonight. Did you know that each night we've been here, we've seen more than 700 people both nights, each night come to Christ and come and make a commitment? And what I'm going to ask you to do is what we've done all over Latin America, all over Europe, all over the Orient, 
all over America, all across Canada. We've asked people to get up out of their seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming symbolically, I need Christ, I want his mercy, I want his love and his grace, I want to know him for myself. Why do I ask you to come forward and make that a public declaration? Because Jesus hung on the cross publicly for you. He didn't do it in private, he did it publicly. And people were against him, sneering at him. He was naked and bleeding. And he did it publicly. And he said that if we're not willing to confess him publicly before men, he will not confess us before his Father, which is in heaven. It's a public commitment. And I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. And after you've all come and stand here, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you and give you some a book that you can take home with you to help you in your Christian growth. And if you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait. If you're in a bus, they'll wait. And you people in the other auditorium or the other room that could not get in here, you can get up and come and the ushers will let you in this building so that you can join those that are going to come. And from the balcony, it's taking a little bit longer than I thought the first night. It's going to take at least three minutes for you to come. So get up and start now, but don't let a little bit of time keep you back and don't let the big crowd keep you back. You just get up and come because it's you before God tonight. The most important commitment that you have ever made. And if you want to bring a friend with you, bring your friend, but get up and come and don't let anything keep you back. We're going to wait and people are going to be praying all over this great Colosseum as you come. You'll never have another moment quite like this. You come. We're going to wait right now. And after you've come, I'll see what you see on that screen. There are people that are standing by. And if you get a busy signal, call back a few minutes later. You'll get, you'll get through because there are hundreds of lines. And be sure and go to church next weekend. You can still call the number on your screen and make your decision for Jesus Christ right now. If the line is busy, simply write the number down and call later. We'll be there as long as the calls keep coming in. We do want to help you, so call the number now. We hope that you'll make your plans to join us again tomorrow night for the next in this series of programs from Hamilton, Ontario. Our special guests will be Sheila Walsh, David Lambeer, Myrtle Hall and George Beverly Shea. Mr. Graham's sermon is entitled, Time to Come Home. So plan to join us tomorrow night and invite a friend to share the telecast with you. Now for Billy Graham and all the team, this is Cliff Barrow saying good night, and may the Lord richly bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. We still have a window of opportunity to reach a lost and dying world with the truth of God's love. It's not too late. We've got an opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ. What are you going to do with it? From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Now today I want you to turn with me
to 2 Peter, the second chapter, beginning with verse 5. I hope you've brought your Bibles, because we want to talk about a very important subject today. The judgment of God, the love of God, and the coming again of Jesus Christ, and the end of the age. Not the end of the world. There's not going to be an end to the world. But there is going to be an end to the age in which we live that's dominated by the devil and dominated by evil. That will come to an end. And Christ the Messiah is going to come back. We want to talk about that a little bit today. The second chapter of 2 Peter. Now, 2 Peter in your Bibles comes right after 1 Peter, if you're having trouble finding it. Beginning with verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto all those who would live ungodly in the future. And deliver just Lot, vexed with the filthy lifestyle of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and trials. If you're going through a serious temptation now or trial now, God knows how to deliver you. If you'll turn to him and pray by faith and believe and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment. Those that are outside of Christ, those that live wicked lives are being reserved until the day of judgment. There is a judgment day coming. The biblical story of Sodom and Gomorrah comes down to us today as an example of what could happen even in this decade or in the decades ahead if we don't turn to God. Now Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities and they were at the place that now the Dead Sea is in the Middle East. The Dead Sea is 10 miles by 50 mile inland lake in the Lord Jordan Valley. It's a mineral-saturated body of water which is 1,260 feet below sea level. It's the lowest part of the world. In Genesis 13, we read about Abraham. And Abraham is going through that part of the world with all of his flocks and all of his family, going to the land that God had promised him. He was a man of God. And he had his nephew with him by the name of Lot. And he saw that the servants of Lot and his servants were not getting along too well. So he said to Lot, Lot, let's divide. We've gotten too big. There are too many of us. Too many cattle. Your cattle and my cattle are getting mixed up. You choose wherever you want to live. If you want to go west toward what is now Palestine, or if you want to go across the Jordan and go to the Jordan Valley, which is lush like a Garden of Eden, you take a choice and I'll take the other way. So Lot looked all around and he looked down toward Sodom. He looked down toward Gomorrah and he saw that that was a very wealthy part of the world, a very wonderful part to live in. He consulted his wife. She said, by all means, we want to go to Sodom. She wanted to go where the good times were. And so Lot told Abraham, all right, Uncle Abraham, we're going to go. We've chosen to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and go down to the lush valley of the Jordan. And we'll take our cattle and our servants and our people and our family, and that's where we'll go. Abraham agreed, said, all right. The Dead Sea was surrounded in that time. It was no Dead Sea, of course. But at that time, it was a lush, unbelievably lush part of the world. 
But with their wealth came a lifestyle of hedonism, sexual obsession, and perversion, the like of which has hardly ever been equaled in the history of the world. So that today the word Sodom is used to describe a certain lifestyle that people may adopt. As God has sent a flood to destroy a corrupted humanity in Noah's day, so upon Sodom and Gomorrah he sent a totally destroying judgment of fire. And that fire of brimstone that fell upon Sodom and Gomorrah not only destroyed it, but sank that part of the world to the lowest part of the earth. Now what were the sins of Sodom? Why did God allow that judgment to fall? The first sin that they had was false security. They were secure. And we today have a security behind our oceans and behind our military power. President Yeltsin has stated that the whole world could be standing unknowingly on the edge of an abyss. And you saw in your papers this morning the problems they're having in Russia right now, in the government. We have a false security. Woe to them that go down to Egypt. Now, Egypt in that day did not have much to do with Israeli people. And yet, time after time, the Israelis would go down to Egypt for help. And he said, woe to them that go down to Egypt for help and stay on horses and trust in chariots. But they look not to the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Now the Egyptians are men and not God, and their horses flesh and not spirit. Isaiah the prophet is speaking in the 31st chapter when he says that. They had false security. They thought they were absolutely secure. Nobody could ever take Sodom and Gomorrah. Then their second sin that the scripture mentions is pleasure. They lived for pleasure. In Job 20, the fifth chapter, it says, The joy-making of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but a moment. You only have a moment to enjoy it. Then you have eternity to regret it. The scripture says there are pleasures in sin for a moment. Then it's all over. And then there's nothing but the remorse and the guilt. The scripture says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Even in laughter, the scripture says, the heart is sorrowful and the end of mirth is heaviness. Even when you're laughing, many people. In Psalm 53, 1, it says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. But if you go back to the original language in Hebrew, here's what it says. The fool hath said in his heart, no to God. He's not saying there's no God. He's just saying no to God. You see, you can't prove scientifically that there is a God, and you can't prove scientifically there's no God. But everybody knows there must be a God. And then there's another sin that Sodom and Gomorrah committed. It was overindulgence. The majority of the world, a great part of the world, lives under what we call the poverty level. And in Luke 21 it says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and the cares of this life, so that that day comes upon you unaware. John Eastwood wrote some time ago, People do not decide to be drunkards or drunk addicts or prostitutes or murderers of, or thieves, but they pitch their tent towards Sodom and the powers of evil overcome them. And how many of us are like that? We pitch our tent towards Sodom. We sort of live half in Sodom and half with Abraham. We sort of enjoy Sodom. We long for the things that Sodom has. We'd like to have the fun and the pleasure we imagine that they're having. We'd like to have all that money. But the powers of evil will overcome you. And you will die before your time. 
and be lost from God. In Jude, the 12th verse, it says, There are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. How many times we see charitable events and we thank God for those that are sincerely interested, but they go to have a big time and to be seen. And there's a spot in their charity. And that's the spot. And then the people of Sodom and Gomorrah had some new strange gods. Whenever a man seeks or honors or exalts anything more than God, that's idolatry. And there are many of us that are guilty of idolatry, but we don't realize it. In Psalm 44, it says, If we have forgotten the name of our God or stretched out our hand to a strange God, shall not God search this out? Romans 1, it says, We've changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator. We worship our bodies and we worship our good times and we spend more on our cosmetics than we do worshiping God and Christ. That's modern humanism. And then they were also guilty of greed. Greed was a plague on the lives of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the addictions that today has thousands of Americans in its vice is gambling. And part of the gambling motivation is greed. Workers throughout the industrialized world are becoming increasingly traumatized by overwork and their effort to earn more than their needs require. So we neglect our families to get more money so that we can, and we don't really need it. God has promised to supply all of our needs, but he's never promised to supply all of our greeds. And then, in the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, so bad that God gave them up. In Romans 1, it says that God just gave them up three times. He said he gave them up. Has God given you up? No, the very fact you're here today shows that God has not given you up. God is still speaking to you. There's still a chance for you to come to Christ. There's still an opportunity for you to receive the love of God and the gift of God in Christ. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient, unthankful, unholy. And anyone who believes in high morality today is laughed at. Jeremiah said that they had forgotten how to blush. And there's a lot of truth in that. Now God warned Sodom. He sent some angels to Abraham to tell Abraham what he was going to do. He was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And Abraham said, wait a minute, Lord. If I would find some real believers in Sodom, if I found 50 righteous men, would you spare it? And God said, yes. He couldn't find 50. So he said to the Lord, all right, Lord, what about if I found 40? Then after a while he said, 30, then 20. Finally he said, if I find 10, Lord, would you spare them? And God said, yes, if you find 10 righteous people, in Sodom, I'll spare Sodom. But he couldn't find them. And that is a lesson to us, the importance of a dedicated minority. A minority of people who believe and who live it. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah, says Isaiah 1, 9. To you Christians, Jesus gave a warning. He said, remember Lot's wife? The angels told you not to look back. If you did look back, you'd be turned to a pillar of salt. Well, she did look back. And she was turned to a pillar of salt. 
And Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. That's an example for us today. Remember Lot's wife, one of the shortest verses in all the Bible. Don't look back. Many of us look longingly at the world and many are like Demas having forsaken Christ because of the love of this present world. Now the climax of history is going to be judgment. The Bible warns that the world is in for a gigantic judgment. The only bright spot is the promised return of Jesus Christ because the scripture teaches from one end to the other that Christ is going to come back someday. He's going to set up his kingdom and evil and the devil are going to be eliminated and this is going to be heaven on earth when Jesus comes back. You see, Jesus Christ loved us so much that he went to the cross and died for us. He took all the hell and the, all the judgment on him at the cross. And the scripture says, God so loved the world. God so loved this present world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, that includes you, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You say, well, when is Christ going to come back? Jesus said, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. We don't know the day. Don't, don't speculate. It's coming. It's sure. He left us certain signs. I wish we had time to go into all of them today. I believe that every one of those signs is being fulfilled right now. And Christ could come back at any time. For How will Christ come? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What a glorious time that's going to be when Christ returns. The voice of the archangel. I'm looking forward to hearing that voice. I've never heard an archangel. And the trump of God. What trump that'll, trumpets that'll be? Now it'll also be a time of personal judgment when you if you've really never received Christ, now you may be baptized and you may be confirmed and you may be a church member and all of that. That's wonderful. I'm thankful. But that's not enough. Jesus talked to Nicodemus and said, Nicodemus, all your religion is not enough. You must be born again. The moment you receive Christ, the moment you open your heart and surrender to him as Lord and Master and Savior, at that moment, your name is written in the book of life. And if my name were not written in that book of life, you'd never get me out of this stadium until I'd made sure it's been written there. Because only those who are written in the book of life are going to enter the kingdom of God. You see, for those who are written in the book of life, Jesus Christ died on the cross. They put nails in his hands and a spike through his side and a crown of thorns on his brow. And he suffered one of the most agonizing physical deaths that a person can suffer. But that wasn't his real suffering. The real suffering of Jesus Christ was when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, God took your sins and my sin and laid on Christ. He bore our sins. He went to hell for us. He took the judgment for us. So the cross is a judgment. What do you have to do? Repent of your sins. And you're not sure that you've repented. To surrender totally to Christ. Your heart, your mind, your body, your life. So that Christ is first in your life. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment this afternoon. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen thousands of people do this past week. Get up out of your seat from all over this stadium and come and stand in front. And after you've all come, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with you. 
and you can get up and go back and join your friends. We're going to give you some literature, a book that will help you in your Christian life. But you get up and come. And don't delay, because he says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. You may never have another moment like this as long as you live. When will you ever see another thing like this in Pittsburgh? Maybe another generation, or maybe never. And as far as you're concerned, it may never be. We're going to wait for you. You come from way up there, wherever you are. God is speaking to you. And back here, where the seats have filled in, you come and join them. Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ. So can you, right where you are. Just call the phone number on your screen right now. Special friends want to help you with this important decision, so don't wait. Please call now. You that have been watching by television, here in this great Three Rivers Stadium in Pittsburgh, where three rivers come together right here, you have heard the message, and God has spoken to you, and we've seen hundreds of people come here, many more hundreds on the way. You can make your commitment to Christ where you are. You can say yes to Christ. He loves you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change you and give you a new life. Let him come into your heart right now. Just say, Lord, I am a sinner and I'm sorry. I do repent of my sins as best I know how. I'm not sure that I know how, but Lord, help me to repent. And help me to believe, Lord. I need your help even in the believing. And help me to follow you and serve you. He'll help you. If you make that commitment, call that number on the screen. Now we're going to wait for others that are still coming down the aisles. There's still time for you to make that important decision. Take a moment right now to call the number on your screen. Someone will pray with you and talk with you about your spiritual condition and the hope and forgiveness found in Jesus Christ. Call right now. This concludes our spring television series. We're so glad you joined us. Just before we leave you for this time, we want to remind you to pray for Billy Graham and the team as we prepare for special meetings in Cleveland, Ohio, and Atlanta, Georgia in the days ahead. Now for Billy Graham and the entire team, this is Cliff Barrow saying goodbye, and may God bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library.
retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free, so come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library.